Hi, everyone, and good morning, and welcome to the Bipartisan Policy Center. We're really glad you could join us here this morning, hopefully over a cup of coffee, and participate in this um, uh, conversation we'll be having on a, the important topic of uh, emerging markets for carbon solutions. I'm Sasha Mackler, and I lead the Energy Project at the Bipartisan Policy Center. And as many of you know, the BPC um, really focuses on trying to find solutions to the most pressing problems that we face as a country. And on the Energy Project, we're very focused on marrying the best analysis with um, uh, the emerging on certain issues so we can drive legislative and policy solutions. And it's really in that spirit that we launched a new project that we call the Farm and Forest Solutions Initiative. Um, and uh, while uh, climate change tends to be a polarizing issue uh, in rural America, there really is an opportunity for bipartisan solutions on certain topics. And that's really exemplified by the leadership we're seeing from uh, the two senators that, we're, that we are privileged to have with us this morning to discuss some of the work that they're doing on these issues. Um, for years, there has been significant interest in carbon markets as a tool to finance investments in conservation practices. Uh, but we've lacked the infrastructure really to facilitate producers and landowners to participate in these markets. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that's thankfully starting to change now uh, because this morning we have two of America's hardest working senators that are working together across the aisle to fix some of these challenges. And we're really privileged, as I said, to have them here this morning to talk about some of the work that they're doing on these issues. Um, so thank you for joining us. And I'd like to turn things over to my colleague, Robert Bonney, who is leading this work for BPC, who will say a bit more about the agenda today and introduce our guests. Thanks, everybody. Great, Sasha. Uh, thank you so much. I really want to thank uh, Senator Stabenow, Senator Braun, for not only their leadership uh, on uh, these this important issue, but also for getting up with us early this morning and, and joining us. We're going to have uh, both of them speak. A little time for question after. I know they've they've got busy schedules and need to get on by nine o'clock. And then we've got a great panel to follow. Uh, encourage everybody in the audience to submit questions through the live chat function on YouTube. Uh, or on Twitter. Um, let me get right uh, to the senators. First, I'm gonna introduce Senator Stabenow and then we'll go to Senator Braun. Uh, many of you know Senator Stabenow. She's the ranking member on the Agriculture, uh, Nutrition and Forestry Committee. I work with Senator Stabenow on the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, and in the 2018 Farm Bill, she, she already began working on uh, bipartisan solutions around climate change. She and Senator Braun have been so important on the Growing Climate Solutions Act, the uh, uh, Rural Forest Markets Act, and, and putting something out there that can really generate bipartisan support. Uh, Senator Stabenow, the floor is yours. Well, thanks, Robert. It's great to be with you this morning and with my friend, uh, Senator Mike Vaughn. Always great to be with you. Unfortunately, it's usually virtually these days, Mike, but it's wonderful to see you this morning and to everybody at the Bipartisan Policy Center for the work that you do all the time. Uh, first of all, let me say that we don't get anything done ever, and I've been involved in public policy a long time, unless it's bipartisan. So uh, I'm excited about the work that we're doing because I think it really can be the basis of some incredibly important work that we all need to be doing right now uh, to address the, the climate crisis that's right in front of us. In fact, whether it's the derecho that flattened the cornfields in Iowa or the horrible fires going on in California or the extreme weather changes that have wiped out entire fruit crops uh, in Michigan uh, over the years. The reality is that climate change is staring our farmers right in the face in real time. And so it's really important, I think, uh, that we are addressing this. And also that while agriculture, you know, farmers, ranchers are impacted so much by what's happening in terms of the climate crisis, I really believe that our producers our farmers and ranchers can really be a key to the solution and really the foundation for bipartisan support, which is why I think um, this is so very important. For decades, ag producers have been on the forefront of voluntary 
climate smart conservation practices. And I say it over and over again, voluntary climate smart conservation practices. And uh, we're looking at things like cover cropping and no-till farms and, and our uh, foresters are uh, also uh, now seeing public recognition for what they've known for a long time, that trees are some of the best carbon captured technology around anywhere. Uh, so over the past 10 years, I just want to take you back a moment because Robert talked about 2018 Farm Bill, which is um, was very important in making a step forward. But the reality is I've been focusing on this really for the last uh, 10 years because back when there was originally a discussion and the House of Representatives passed a climate bill, and this is back in 2009 when we were debating a cap and trade uh, system I actually authored the, what I called the Clean Energy Partnership Act, which was to bring agriculture and forestry in as partnerships uh, with manufacturers, other businesses, and a, in a, basically a carbon capture and carbon market system to set up a carbon market. That's what I was hoping that we would do at that time. And, and frankly, uh, you know, I often wonder if we'd done that 10 years ago, would, you know, what would have happened in terms of slowing down all of this. So the work that didn't happen, 2014, we put in place uh, some aggressive new conservation efforts. As Robert knows, the Re Regional Conservation Partnership Program, again, the environmentalists, farmers, uh, agribusiness, all working together. And we set up something new called the Conservation Innovation Grants, which really were piloting efforts to bring together farmers in a, some kind of in a carbon sequester uh, marketplace to be able to sell carbon credits and in fact farmers in North Dakota were part of that process and they sold carbon credits to uh, my friends at General Motors at Chevy so that was one of the early efforts then you go to the 2018 farm bill which by the way we passed by a record 87 votes out of 100. Senator Roberts and I are very proud about that uh, effort to come together to address all of agriculture. And we, we built on that by making changes in crop insurance to actually incentivize and cover, cover crops, um, expanded what we did in conservation, and put in soil health uh, a new soil health initiative and the forest health initiatives to help producers sequester carbon. And in fact, the first awards for the 2018 landmark soil health demonstration trials just went out earlier this week. So here we go. So now we're up to where we are today. And I think what Senator Braun and I have uh, been working on, and thank you for your support, uh, the Growing Climate Solutions Act is fundamental to putting in place the structure to take us where we want to go. Because uh, farmers and ranchers uh, want to have confidence that they can scale up it, sustainable practices and tap into new economic opportunities through creating a voluntary uh, carbon market. So we have over 50 organizations from uh, the Environmental Defense Fund to the American Farm Bureau and, and National Farmers Union. And um, I'm very uh, very excited and, and very committed to moving this forward. So I would just say briefly, what, what is this all about? First of all, farmers need to know uh, who are the experts? Who can they count on to tell them what they need to be doing to add to the carbon sequestration that they're doing? So we establish a USDA certification for trusted experts that the farmers need in order to generate and ultimately sell their carbon credits, um, that uh, that's going to certify the technical assistance providers, that's going to help them, the third party verifiers. This is very important because if farmers and ranchers and, and foresters are doing certain practices and they're told that will create uh, additional carbon sequestration and that they will be able to transform that into carbon credits and sell it to private users, they have to be able to count on that being accurate. And people on the other side of that have to be able to count on that being verifiable and measurable. So this is the system that we are talking about setting up, including an online one-stop shop 
for our producers and foresters to make sure they know how to first get their foot in the door and how to be able to do what they want to do and have confidence that that's going to translate, frankly, into an important new revenue stream. And then finally, the Rural Forest Markets Act, which really addresses a lot of the challenges around particularly our family-owned forests um, that are about half the forests in the country are privately owned. And they've traditionally been shut out of participating in carbon markets due to the high upfront costs. So what we've done is uh, propose establishing a rural forest market investment program with guaranteed loans up to $150 million for nonprofits and companies to help small and family foresters uh, create uh, the system for storing carbon and then give them the other supports that they need. So I really believe that um, now more than ever, uh, we have to step up as those in, uh, leaders in food and agriculture and in forestry, uh, and we can lead in what I call land-based or others call nature-based climate solutions. And if we do this right, producer-led, voluntary, bipartisan, uh, do this through the USDA, I think we can make a major difference. And so, Robert, I'm, I appreciate being here and appreciate uh, all the work that the center is doing and everybody on the call. Um, we don't have a, any time to waste. When we look at what's happening right now, we better make this a high priority. So thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Stabenow. Senator Braun, I want to uh, turn it over to you now. Um, noting that you've obviously built a successful business in uh, Indiana before coming to the Senate, but what really interests me about your background is that you're also a tree farmer. You own forest land in uh, Indiana, and so you have a unique perspective on on these issues and what it what it means to be a landowner and to deal with this. So, Senator Braun, floor is yours. Thank you, and Debbie, excellent job of uh, describing the kind of uh, evolution of in the Senate at the federal government level of where we're at now. And I think it is an opportune time to really move. Uh, my interest in conservation goes back into uh, my high school days. I started the ecology club back then, uh, lived away for a couple of years, moved back to my hometown and kind of out of luck, uh, fell in love with forestry. And I wanted to live in the country and actually had uh, my uh, banner, Indiana Farms and Forests, uh, which was how I started uh, investing in uh, ground. And I bring a unique perspective in that on the Agriculture Committee, uh, I'm still as active as you can be. Um, and it's a passive investment in a sense uh, legally, but every weekend I go back and still do this. My therapy now for this new job is to stay close to the land. And I, uh, Tuesday morning before I uh, flew out, actually was working in a timber stand, doing timber stand improvement. Um, I know what CRP is, uh, WRP. I've been involved in those programs. Thank goodness those were there available for farmers that wanted to be good stewards of their ground. And we're at such a unique moment that uh, with Debbie's history on the Agriculture Committee, knowing how this place works well, in my uh, kind of so recent uh, exit from, I call it the real world, and still stay closely in touch with it, uh, we've got a unique opportunity. And we are unique in the sense that since I've been here, I don't think there's been a bipartisan bill out of the gate with the Growing Climate Solutions uh, Bill and uh, the other one we've got out there. So that says it can be done. I'm probably the most outspoken Republican on reforming healthcare because it's uh, something we need to do better at. It's the number one issue out there. The number two issue is climate. And in the time that I've been here, uh, was the first Republican to get on the Climate Solutions Caucus, got six others to follow because there was that latent interest. It just took uh, someone to, I guess, cross the threshold. We've accomplished a lot. And mostly industry, the stakeholders in transportation, energy, agriculture, steel, concrete, the CO2 emitters 
want to be part of the solution. And that's the big difference between reforming healthcare. They're digging in. They do not want to change the status quo. That's why I'm optimistic that we've got a good bill out here. Could be the first significant piece of legislation that gets across the threshold, my sense of it, uh, since maybe criminal justice reform. I, I view it as being that likely because we've got now evangelicals, we've got farmers, we've got young conservatives that came to me and probably said, hey, we are so happy someone on the conservative side is stepping out and uh, saying something about it. So I'll let it there. I know you got a bunch of questions. So uh, pleasure to be here today. Great. Thank you, uh, Senator Braun. I might start with a question for you, which is, um, you know, we're obviously here talking about policy uh, solutions, but we're going to need significant private <laughs> investment. We're going to need to tap into the private sector. One of the things your all's legislation, uh, both pieces of legislation does, is, is allow us to do that. So if you could just talk a little bit how important it is to tap into uh, to the private sector uh, and how we might think about structuring policy that allows us to do that. It's very important because, you know, the other thing I didn't mention that I'm uh, really interested in is how we fiscally get the federal government back into a place where it's living responsibly and sustainably. And, we need to attend to that as well. So in the meantime, when you've got voluntary and compliance markets out there, when in the little, I guess, under a year that we've had the climate caucus, you've not only got ag, uh, transportation, energy, other players, they want to use their own funds to offset their own carbon footprint and gets back to what I said earlier. Uh, there's an interest privately to do what we have not done, you know, with healthcare. And that is to amass the capital, uh, be out there that, hey, we want it done. And one of the biggest impediments is that we've got a lot of that in place. We need to convince on my side of the aisle that many of the places we think aren't interested in uh, carbon pricing or tapping into voluntary <clears throat> markets simply philosophically that that's not compatible, it is. And that's why I ask all of the players speak to my side of the aisle that wants us to get engaged because so much of it is sitting there ready to go. That's the heavy lift politically. And I think if you can do that, some of this stuff will quickly get into motion. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things I think both pieces of Ural's legislation does is it it starts to create some confidence for those uh, folks in the private sector to to step forward. And <clears throat> Senator Stabenow, I wonder if you can talk about that a little bit. Just, I mean, I think about um, uh, you know farmers or or forest owners or ranchers. They've got sometimes they have debt on their operations or. You know, they don't have a whole lot of time to think about what these carbon markets mean. Right. Can you just talk a little bit about <laughs> how this generates some confidence in these markets? Sure. Thank you, Robert. And and let me just also piggyback on what Senator Braun just said in terms of the question of uh, public-private sector. That's really what we've been all about in agriculture when we in the 2014 Farm Bill set up the Regional Conservation Program. It was about matching funds, federal government matching the private sector, environmental conservation groups, agribusness, and so on, to, to leverage public and private funds. We do that all the time. And in fact, in research, we do that with the foundation that Senator Roberts and I uh, originated in the 2014 Farm Bill and, and continued and strengthened in 2018. So it, that's what we do. We do partnerships. We do public-private efforts which is why this is so important. And when it comes to confidence, again, um, well, I don't know any part of our economy uh, that's been uh, hit harder than farmers. Uh, our farmers and ranchers, everything from the chaos in trade, the chaos in the weather, um, <clears throat> COVID-19, I mean, everything uh, that's going on. Uh, I happen to believe coming from a small rural community in northern Michigan that we need family farmers. It's not in our best interest as a country to have just a few huge 
conglomerates sort of controlling everything on food um, that, you know, it's, and it's about our way of life. It's about uh, our rural towns uh, like Claire, where I grew up, where it's, it's very much not just about the economy, it's about the community. And um, so when we look at confidence, we've got to look at where farmers are right now. And I think they have to know if in the midst of everything uh, that if they're going to take their time, if they're going to take their resources, they have to have confidence that this is going to work and that it's real. And one of the reasons I think it's important to set up the structure through the USDA is because that is the place where uh, our agricultural community uh, has confidence. That's where they are working on a daily basis in terms of all the farm uh, farm bill programs and so on. So it needs to go through there. It needs to be voluntary. And we set up an advisory committee of producers as well. But folks need to know that when they are, you know, doubling down on what they do on conservation, um, adding to what they are doing on sequestration, that there is there is in fact a way to measure it. And, and I've also had, you know, concerns on the other side, environmental uh, community wants to know that it's added on. It's not what is currently being done and always being done, that it actually is about sequestering more carbon. And how do you measure that? Uh, and how do we make that as permanent as possible? And so, you know, uh, the balancing act of that um, is very important, but it starts with having farmers, foresters, ranchers, um, say, uh, knowing that if these are the folks who know, these are the technical experts, these are the folks that can certify for you. And in fact, if it is certified, if it is verified, that they can have confidence then, they can take uh, the, the carbon credits and be able to move into the private market and generate revenue. I mean, from my standpoint, this is a win, 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 win <laughs> from, from agriculture who needs new markets and can lead the way in solving <clears throat> one of the, if not the biggest crisis you know, facing us, really. When I, I want to uh, ask you both about the Rural F uh, Forest Market Act as well. <clears throat> and we've seen in the voluntary markets as well as maybe California's compliance markets, some uh, significant projects uh, using carbon dollars to uh, improve forest management, reforestation, those types of things. But they've tended to be large landowners. And one of our, if we're going to be successful, both in agriculture and forestry, we need to think about how do we get to smaller, medium-sized landowners. And I wonder if you all could talk about um, uh, the opportunity here on the forestry side to kind of uh, engage some of those smaller landowners. So I'll start on that because I, over time, become a larger landowner. And it's even difficult there unless you're doing it, I guess, in the context of, uh, like a warehouser, international paper, or somebody that's got huge land holdings and would have the wherewithal uh, staff-wise to somehow do that deal, uh, USDA and the entity within the USA, USDA is called the Farm Service Agency. Uh, what farmers, tree farmers, are in and out of the Farm Service Agency, you know, several times a year, so it's convenient and most uh, land is actually held not by the big corporate landowners. It's owned in a disaggregated way by small landowners. So the beauty of this bill is that it's the portal of the Farm Service Agency through the USDA that farmers go in and out of. That is where you certify your conservation reserve program, your CRP acres, your wetland reserve program. They are used to it. So if we can keep this simple and to where the certification process is easy, whether it's row crops or forest ground, and forestry generally gets overlooked as a, a component of agriculture. When you look at in a state like Indiana, and I'm sure it's similar in Michigan, the value added from the tree to the piece of furniture adds up to more than corn and soybeans. And if you look at the number of acres, you'd think uh, the other way. So it's got huge, I think, ramifications. Uh, most would wonder, how can my forest actually uh, get 
some type of revenue source, then it gets down to you, how you manage it. Once a forest is mature, it is not, it's holding a lot of carbon in the wood it's built over time, but it's not sequestering marginally more. And so actually a forest that is growing, uh, which is greener as a rule, it also addresses issues like we've seen on the West Coast. So there are a lot of uh, synergistic effects, just a few of which I've described in uh, Many view their forest ground, especially farmers that own a lot of it, as something that they don't pay much attention to. All of a sudden, if they're getting so much per acre for stuff that's easy to manage, uh, I think that's a win-win. It'll be an eye-opener to them, and uh, I think that small landowner across the country gets involved in a very grassroots way with the bill that we've got out there. Senator Stabenow, thoughts would just, on this question? I would just add, Robert, just a, just a little bit to that, and, and that is just to emphasize again that we're, you know, helping our smaller farmers and medium-sized foresters with upfront costs, I think, is really important. If we can uh, help them and uh, if private investors can help on the front end to get things going, I think that will make a, a real difference. And folks and the uh, foresters will be very interested in doing this. A lot of times it's just, how do you get started? So I want to be respectful of y'all. So y'all's time. I want to ask you uh, one final question, um, just about the changing political landscape. We all know that climate change continues to be a polarizing issue in some parts of rural America. Um, but at the same time, I think there, if you look at the support for your all's legislation, it is very broad in agriculture <laughs> and in forestry. Just your all's thinking on sort of the, some of the changes we're starting to see in some of the rural stakeholder groups in engaging around some of these issues. I don't know, Senator Braun, do you want to start off? Sure. I referred to it earlier, and um, I think it goes, uh, it's one of those issues that uh, you feel it more, of course, if you're living in a place like California. I mean, uh, look at the real costs uh, of what's happening there. In a place like Indiana, maybe Michigan, uh, lakes, uh, Great Lakes that have been at uh, all-time high levels where you're starting to erode infrastructure in places. Uh, you know, it's gonna be a little different impact everywhere, but in general, people know something is up. And I think in the conservative places, like especially like a state like Indiana, uh, when I had young conservatives, I had evangelicals, uh, religious uh, people across the spectrum, and farmers <clears throat> reach out to me and say, hey, kudos, we needed to be doing this. This tells me that even though the impact might not be as stark in all places, you still see it. And not only in California, you see it across the world. People know that we at least need to do something like we're talking about to where philosophically, Debbie cited, this is a win-win. Uh, it's not costing the federal government anything. And we are a little slower to move on my side of the spectrum. And I think as long as we come out with stuff like this, we're gonna be able to tap in to the general interest that we're seeing. And then you evolve into something <clears throat> which can surprise me, how many business owners, corporations, want carbon pricing. Uh, that was a big surprise to me. It would blow up the system on my side currently. We'll take one step at a time, but we're moving in the right direction. Well, and let me just add uh, to that, Robert. I mean, I think first and foremost, um, the severe and chaotic weather is hitting everybody right in the face. Um, <clears throat> we don't have to talk about ideology, as Senator Ron said, is, is very practical, uh, I think, going forward. But, um, you know, it, traditionally, our farmers uh, believe in science. That's how they operate, you know, and uh, uh, and research and science and information. And when you look at what's happening, um, pretty hard to ignore, unfortunately, over 100 years of using 
you know, it, pr producing carbon pollution is up in the atmosphere and it's causing a lot of problems. And we got to figure out a way to deal with that. And uh, um, and that's just what for everybody. I think that's common sense. So the uh, the the weather and uh, is really and and all of the impacts are really affecting it. Second thing is. Uh, this really is a moment where it's, we've been emphasizing um, farmers and uh, foresters can lead the way. And this is something that is going to help create new markets. And that's, a, that's great. I mean, if we can create new markets, new opportunities um, for folks uh, in rural America and folks involved in agriculture and forestry and solve uh, you know, the, the big issue affecting all of us. There are a lot of issues affecting all of us, but this is one that pretty profound and uh, getting more and more severe. And if we can do this in a way that provides opportunity for people, why wouldn't we do that? I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. And again, um, I think what we're proposing is that this be led in an effective way by producers. So uh, you put it all together, and I know in Michigan now, it doesn't matter where I go or who I'm talking to. We, you know, by the way, we have more diversity of crops than any state but California. So we we grow something of everything, and um, our producers now say to me, "Look, we, we know that uh, it, well, that climate change is real. The weather is changing. Tell us what you know. What should we do? What can we do?" Um, and they so they want information. They want a structure. They want to have confidence. Um, and uh, being a part of the solution, and they understand it can create markets. And I think we need to get moving on this as quickly as possible. Well, I want to thank you both for uh, your time this morning. You, it's obviously a very busy time of year for you all. I just really appreciate uh, your time, but in particular, appreciate your leadership on this. And I know everybody at the BPC and the folks we're working with look forward to working with you all on this. Thanks very so good. much. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. So um, we're, we're now going to turn to our uh, other panel. We've got other, uh, uh, we've got a, a great panel um, that are going to talk about these issues in some more depth. I'm going to uh, introduce them uh, very quickly and then just jump right into questions. We've already got some good questions coming in from uh, from uh, the audience, so I'll I'll uh, put some of those into the mix. Um, Tom Martin, uh, CEO of the American Forest Foundation, uh, been in this space for a long time, National Audubon Society, National Park Conservation Association. Tom, thanks for being with us today. We've got Maria Bowman from uh, the Soil Health Partnership, uh, formerly at uh, USDA and the Economic Research Service, and uh, grew up not far from me here in the Shenandoah Valley, been, been around agriculture a whole life. And then lastly, uh, Debbie Reed, former uh, Senator Kerry from Nebraska staffer, I think when we first met and uh, led the uh, Coalition on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases and uh, worked at USDA and, and, and now with the Ecosystem Services Market Consortium. Thanks to uh, the three of you uh, for joining us today. Debbie, I might start with you and just ask you a little bit about what the uh, Ecosystem Services Market Consortium is doing, and a little bit how the Growing Climate Solutions Act that that the senators talked about today, how that kind of fits into your all's model. Yeah, thanks, Robert, and thanks, um, everyone. And actually, um, hearing from the senators was a great introduction to what we're doing. So, ESMC is a public-private partnership, and we're working across the entire agricultural supply chain and value chain with companies such as ADM, Bungie, Cargill, Nestle, Mars, Deneau, General Mills, uh, Land O'Lakes, others, as well as organizations like uh, the American Farm Bureau Federation, National Farmers Union, Soil Health Partnership, corn growers, soybean growers, and then NGOs, including TNC, WWF, and then others, agri-tech companies. And what we're doing is we're investing together in a uh, national scale standardized harmonized market for the agricultural sector. And we're really working right now to build and test the entire infrastructure together. So we have a series of projects across the country that are member led where members, uh, particularly members who have agriculture in their supply chain, 
are working with us to, and their farmers in their supply chain, their ranchers in their supply chain. And we're generating credits. So we, ESMC, what we've done is we've developed science-based standardized protocols that meet the needs of that market. So we are generating through our projects and testing the entire market system. Uh, we're generating soil carbon credits, uh, net greenhouse gas credits, water quality credits, and water quantity credits. Because all of the activities that actually move the needle and impact greenhouse gases in agriculture also impact water, water utilization as well as water quality and things like biodiversity. So we're really working to capture all of those benefits to generate the credits in a quantified, verified, certified program and then sell them. And so we're really focused on transparency, credibility. We're working with the global certification bodies, gold standard and sustained cert. And that's really what the companies, the buyers are looking for, right? Is making sure that we're focusing on outcomes not necessarily practices. And we're taking a, a holistic systems approach. Um, so we're neutral as to whether you're a conventional or an organic system. Um, and we cover the breadth of activities in production agriculture, including livestock, ranching, um, and then row crop agriculture. And we're uh, starting to focus on specialty crops. So we're really just trying to build that infrastructure with, so that whether you're a farmer or rancher in the Pacific Northwest or the Southeast, and whether you're a buyer in the uh, Northern Great Plains or the Southern Great Plains, the, the system, the standards, the metrics all look the same. And um, ensuring that we're meeting both buyer needs and seller needs. And of course, sellers are the farmers and ranchers who actually make all of the changes on the ground. Great. And, and I want to talk, I want to um, go to Maria, to you now, and to have you talk a little bit about the soil health partnership um you know debbie talked about some of the work we're doing there's a lot or she's doing there's a lot of interest in her work and elsewhere around soil health carbon sequestration nutrient management i wonder if you can talk about a little bit around your work and maybe some of the barriers that you see about sort of large-scale adoption of some of the uh, soil practices that will generate greenhouse gas benefits Sure. Thanks, Robert, and thanks for the invitation to be here this morning and be a part of the discussion. During the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of interest in and excitement around these soil health practices and management systems, and we have seen an uptick in their use. So between the 2012 and the 2017 Census of Agriculture, the use of cover crops is just an example of one of these practices increased by about 50 percent. But cover crop use still covers only about 4% of cropland acres in the United States. So that increase, I think, reflects the hard work of programs like ours and the financial assistance from federal and state programs. But there's also still a lot of barriers to adoption. And at SHP, we promote the adoption of soil health practices for both economic and environmental benefit. We are a program of the National Corn Growers Association, and I think what really distinguishes us is that we're both farmer-led and farmer-focused. Uh, we work in 16 states and with more than 200 farmers, and what we're doing on the ground with farmers is setting them up with one of our regional field managers as they try one of these soil health management practices that has the potential to impact greenhouse gas emission reductions um, or carbon sequestration. Those types of practices include no or reduced tillage, cover crops, and they work with a field manager to design a trial to compare their conventional management system to a new soil health practice or management system. And then we collect data through the course of that trial to evaluate the impact of the practice change. And the other important piece of this partnership is that we're really working with that farmer to support them through the experimentation process of adopting these practices. It's not enough to just tell farmers do these practices and you'll see the benefits. Uh, there can be a lot of upfront costs and uncertainty about those practices for the farmer. For example, in the case of a practice like cover crops, 
Um, a farmer has to decide the types of species they're going to use. They have to figure out how they're going to plant them. Sometimes there's a, a new equipment purchase. Uh, depending on the year or the weather conditions, your cover crop might not grow. You might not get that biomass sand out there that provides some of the important benefits. And then you have to figure out how to kill it so you can get your cash crop into the field. So a lot of challenges for a farmer if they're working with one of these practices for the first time. Um, and it can sometimes take several years of experimentation. And I think that's really where our work comes in, is that we provide financial and technical assistance to the farmer throughout that process. And as a result, in our experience, we've seen a number of the farmers we work with uh, expand those practices to additional acres on their farm. So typically we'd see them work on that field for a little bit and try out some things with planting or termination, uh, get comfortable with it, and then expand it to more acres. And I think that really speaks to the power of technical assistance in addition to the markets that we're working to develop. Great. And Tom, I wanna to turn to you now Maria talked a little bit about, you know, how to engage uh, uh, lots of producers on this. You've got a, a similar challenge that that you've been dealing with and and in an exciting way because you're starting to bring in private capital now. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about uh, American Forest Foundation, but you're all uh, family forest carbon project and how you're trying to figure out how you scale this stuff up for these smaller and medium sized uh, forest owners and what types of tools you need in order to do that. Thanks Robert and thanks to you and the bipartisan Senator for, uh, Center for doing this. Um, the American Forest Foundation gives family landowners the tools they need to be great stewards of their land and helps create market access for them that can support the kinds of conservation activities that they're passionate about. In the 22 million Americans that are out there that own forest land, if you look at what they care about, it's leaving their land better than they found it and contributing to wildlife habitat, to clean water, to clean air. They're looking to do a piece of that, but there are a couple of big barriers they hit. And I'm really pleased that the Growing Climate Solutions Act, as well as the Rural Forest Markets Act, deal with two of the biggest barriers they face. And the first one is, the technical barrier. What can I do on my land that will store carbon above baseline and do it in a way that makes my forest healthier and more resilient at the same time? They need technical assistance from places they can trust to be able to make those decisions. A second piece is the way the carbon markets work is that you get paid for a ton of carbon after you've stored it. But you've got to invest in the practice up front that's going to actually produce that carbon over time. That disconnect, that period of time makes it really difficult for family landowners to be able to finance those upfront activities. The Rural Forest Markets Act, by offering loan guarantees, can find, uh, can help facilitate a market that pays landowners at least a portion of what they would earn up front, and then they can collect on the carbon later to pay back those kinds of loans. Those two things remove really important technical barriers for the markets. We're really excited with our partners at the Nature Conservancy who are full partners in developing this program. We're excited about providing a means for landowners who are passionate about their land, passionate about conservation, a mechanism into private voluntary markets that can help us combat climate change. Great, and I, we've got a, a one question we have from the audience uh, is around research and what we could think about in terms of what investments need to be made in, in, in research, accounting, other things. And Maria, maybe I'll start with you and then Debbie go to you. Um, uh, if, if, as policymakers think about research, what should they be thinking about? Yeah, I can take a stab at that. So I think it's, we know that it's taken a number of years of research and adaptation of how we produce crops to increase their productivity. And so I think there are still a lot of the basics that we need to figure out around how these practices like no-till and cover crops uh, fit into a farmer's production system. Because I think 
ideally we'd be able to give a farmer a soil health management prescription or recipe and tell them that they could get a certain outcome if they followed that, but we're just not there yet. Um, so I think demonstrating the feasibility of those practices and research around how they contribute to a suite of other farming challenges like weed management, nutrient management, and yield resiliency is really important because I think right now we're still at the stage where uh, we believe that a lot of these benefits exist, but we haven't really documented them in a way that speaks to, as the senators were talking about this, farmers wait for the science to arrive before they implement a lot of these practices and new innovations in farming. And so I think the more we can build that evidence base for them to have management recommendations that are evidence-based, that's really important. Uh, the other type of research that I would highlight that would really contribute to the market development of some of the solutions proposed in the Growing Climate Solutions Act is research around some of the new and emerging technologies that can reduce the cost of monitoring, reporting, and verification of practices. So right now, we rely a lot in the case of carbon on soil testing, which can be very expensive. It involves getting somebody out there in the field. And I think it's really important, especially at this stage of the game, to invest in some of those new technologies so that we can tie what's happening on the ground to remote or proximal sensing of soil properties like carbon storage and carbon sequestration. Debbie, I, ma I imagine that rings a little bell for you as well. Anything you want to <laughs> add to that? Yeah, I wholly endorse everything Maria said. I think it's really important um, that we have good science. I think one additional point, a finer point that I'd like to make is about soil carbon, right? So scientists globally acknowledge that we can no longer pick and choose which technologies to focus on to mitigate climate change, to bring down atmospheric concentrations of, of carbon. And soil carbon is an incredibly important tool for us to do that. And one that actually builds resilience in agricultural systems and forestry systems and at all our working lands, right? But we have a dearth of data on actual soil carbon content across the board, across the country, um, by soil type, by region, and what actually moves the needle and increases carbon storage um, in terms of holistic systems-based approaches for management. Maria touched on that, but actually measuring soil carbon down to different, different depths and figuring out what's going on there. We really don't know, you know beyond really the top six inches what's happening. And there's evidence that the, a lot of the carbon is migrating down into the soil later, layer deeper, right? We don't know a lot about that. And we have a lot of deep rooted systems that can actually do that, pull the carbon down deeper into the soil labor, which it makes it more permanent. So just a lot more research focusing on that so that we have better information. And again, no, tying it back to the systems-based approaches, we know what moves the needle the most will give us greater confidence moving forward. Tom, I got to think there are a lot of research issues on the forestry side as well, even probably into the wood, wood some of the wood products uh, world as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a yes and because Maria and uh, Debbie were spot on on what they said. Um, for forest, uh, baseline inventory is really important. The U.S. Forest Service runs something called the Forest and Inventory Analysis. They look at forests across the country every five to seven years. That data is vital for all of us that work in this space. And so continuing that data gathering is a big part of a research base. Secondly, um, you know, wood build, using wood in uh, building construction is a great way uh, for us to attack climate change. And the Forest Service can provide real insight into what types of wood, under what conditions, have what contribution that they make in terms of substitution with concrete or steel. And they can do it in a way that supports sustainable forestry. So um, I think those are things that, in addition to what Maria and Debbie talked about, that are unique to the uh, uh, forest world. So um, just to think more, bro, we talked about research. We talked about uh, uh, some of the uh, Growing Climate Solutions Act, the Rural Forest Markets Act. Are there other policy uh, areas that policymakers should be thinking about uh, to, to kind of encourage these, uh, these types of markets? Debbie, you want to uh, start us off? Yeah, thank you. 
So um, those acts really do a lot to help us with, you know, what has been called out, right? The technical assistance as well as verification assistance. Um, where we could use, I think, additional support is really knowing, Tom, Tom alluded to this, right, for forestry, what are actually the practices on the landscape beyond the ones we know a lot about, right? Things like no-till and cover cropping. But what are the practices that farmers and ranchers are engaged in that are moving the needle? We just don't have good granular data um, across the country so that we could know um, what systems, what practices are working in individual regions, right? And in individual production systems that really help to move the needle. And if we had more data on that, we could do a couple of things. We could know what the baseline is across the country, but at, at more granular regional levels. And then we can know where to concentrate and focus to really, again, move the needle and create impact to benefit everyone, but you know, particularly to benefit those farmers and ranchers who need the technical assistance, who need the financial incentives. Um, so for me, that's one particular uh, area. And then another is just sharing data, like specific research data sets that can populate models that can really better quantify at scale what is really happening. There's a lot of data that we just don't have access to. And if all modelers, could have access to that, right? If all um, researchers could put their data into a shared pool led by the federal government, for instance, it would kind of lift all boats so that we have improved quantification across the board. Great. Maria, thoughts on this question? Other policy areas that, that policymakers should be looking at? I think the only thing I have to add to what Debbie already said is that, you know, we like to think about all of the different benefits that farmers are producing on an acre in addition to food, fiber, fuel, um, thinking about these ecosystem services. And while both of these acts go a long way toward thinking about climate, I think thinking about water quality is another challenge that we're facing in our society and how we can support that through policy is also really important because carbon Greenhouse gas benefits are an important piece of the equation, but I think water quality is equally important. And that's certainly what we hear from farmers in a lot of their states, that those are the challenges that they're facing as well. Tom, we've got a, a question from uh, audience about uh, incentivizing wood products markets. How do we, uh, you know, uh, are, are there things that policymakers should be thinking about there you guys are obviously dealing with the un, uh, the upfront investment costs, as you talked about, in entering some of these uh, in, entering into carbon projects. But thinking about end uses for forest products, particularly long-lived uh, wood products, uh, right. is particularly really important. We know that we sequester a lot of carbon annually there every year. What, what's what does a policy you know suite look like for maybe thinking about some of those things? So I think uh, a number of things. Uh, first, tax credit, tax deductions for uh, using wood uh, as a, a building product to help speed uh, their substitution where they can provide demonstrable climate benefits. I think that's a piece. Secondly, research that continues to um, reveal the depth and nature of the advantage of using wood products, long-lived wood products, and uh, the construction world. And I think third, um, recognition and promotion of that, uh, of, of using those wood products and all the benefits they provide. I guess the final piece is um, making a clear tie between how good forest markets actually support sustainable, resilient forests. I think that tie that is too is made too little and that acts as a barrier to the adoption of uh, forest, uh, forest products and wood and construction. Tom, I might stay with you on this as well. And we talked about it a little bit with the two senators, but there is growing interest in the private sector, voluntary markets, companies wanting to be uh, carbon neutral. Um, I'm interested in your work, kind of how you're seeing this manifest itself down in the projects uh, you all are are working on. Um, you know, are there companies coming coming to you all looking for this type of of service? Um, how does that and 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 you know, have you seen a significant increase in the last few years? Sort of how is this manifesting itself on the ground for you all? 
Yeah, I'd say there's been an incredible acceleration of the interest in the private sector in investing in uh, climate solutions that help reduce their footprint. Um, they are hearing from investors, they are hearing from their employees, and they're hearing from their customers, you've got to do better on climate. And because of that, we're seeing uh, a broad array of companies from a broad variety of sectors that are coming and saying, what can we do to actually help make things better out there? Not just reduce our own carbon emissions, but what can we do to actually store more carbon naturally? And so the work we're doing with the Nature Conservancy has attracted um, the big announcement that many people saw was the $10 million investment by, from Amazon. But you look at who's supporting the Rural Forest Markets Act. You've got Delta. You've got REI. You've got uh, Westrock and um, uh, Domtar from the forest products industry. You've got this 3M. You've got this broad variety of companies from a bunch of different sectors who are saying, we want these markets to emerge. We want to participate in them. And we need government's help to get the uh, markets launched so they're credible and efficient. Maria, I think this is something that farmers are starting to see as well, I'm assuming. Uh, um, demand from their uh, folks uh, upstream that are buying corn, soybeans, uh, other products. How, you know, how are, how are farming, farmers experiencing this? And does it feed into the work you guys are doing at the Soil Health Partnership? Certainly, I think farmers are feeling the pressure from all sides. They'll get they get pressure from their supply chain companies to implement practices that reduce the emissions associated with producing a crop. Um, they're being approached by companies that are getting them interested in carbon markets without a lot of details around what they need to do or how they're going to be compensated. Uh, they're also, I think rightfully nervous about regulation around water quality and how that might impact them going forward. And so from our perspective, it's just really important to make sure that we're setting up markets that compensate farmers for the ecosystem services they're producing, as opposed to this idea that they're going to be subject to the whims of all of the folks that they interact with, whether it's their supply chain company or the regulators in their state. So uh, it, couldn't, it couldn't be coming at a more important time to provide resources to farmers to establish a credible credible and legitimate marketplace. Debbie, you know as much about this question as anybody, given who sits on your consortium. What are you, what are you hearing from those uh, companies and what are the type of services they need from your organization and others to be able to act on that demand that they're feeling from, from uh, customers, employees, and others? Yeah, so um, it, it Corporations who are really taking on major commitments to reduce their environmental footprint are doing it for a whole host of reasons, not the least of which is risk. They share in the risk that farmers are experiencing every day, right? And if the farmers and ranchers are um, feeling risk and having impacts, that impact is felt all the way down the supply chain. So everyone in our consortium is really focused on how do we build resilience? How do we share the tools so that farmers and ranchers can help us all reduce our risk and reduce our environmental footprint across the spectrum, um, including, as Maria pointed out, not just greenhouse gases, but water quality, water quantity, biodiversity, et cetera. So we, um, that is actually a, an important component of what we're trying to do is to give those companies and the buyers a program that they can tap into that meets their needs in a standardized, science-based, right, harmonized way. And then give the farmers and the ranchers the tools they need as well to um, create the impacts that we can then measure and monetize, right, in the form of credit. So it's exactly right. And we've seen more than a 75% increase just over the past uh, three to four years in commitments being made by companies for whom agricultural supply chain is a huge component of their footprint. So the private sector is really leading on this and um, is fully cognizant that we're all in this together and we have to work together to actually make it work. Um, so that is the strength of working across, if you will, the value chain and the supply chain. Great. Tom, I'm going to give you the, the, the closing yeah. remark here. 
So there's one other reason all of this is really important. If we're going to address climate change, it's going to take a sustained focus and commitment over decades. And America is kind of a 50-50 country. We've been going back and forth. So if you think about what do we do to make climate change issues and solutions politically sustainable? Private voluntary markets are bringing in corporate folks who in the past have been on all sides of debates about climate change. And regulation is going to play an important part on emissions. But if we're going to do land-based solutions, it offers the opportunity to bring those companies to the table and to support it. And the, for rural Americans, it gives them a concrete stake in the solution to climate change that can help change that cultural political divide around uh, what we're doing on climate change. So the private voluntary markets that are in the two bills that have been talked about by Senators Braun and uh, Stabenow have an important political component if we're gonna be able to address climate change. Uh, great point, and uh, we'll end it there. I want to thank uh, the three of you uh, for joining us. I thought the, the senators were great, and I thought you all added a lot of color, detail to why their efforts are important, but other places that policymakers need to think about. And I think as Tom's comments point out, there is a real opportunity to bridge the urban-rural divide. There's a real opportunity to bridge the political divide. Um, we all know uh, the challenges that we saw in 2008, 2009, 2010 with Waxman-Markey and, and the polarization around this issue. There's a real opportunity here to, I think, bring folks together uh, and to benefit the climate, but to do a great, uh, a, a great uh, bunch of work around conservation, water quality, uh, rural economies, and other benefits. So thank, thank you all uh, for joining us today. Thanks everybody in the audience for uh, hanging with us. Sorry we didn't get to all your questions, um, but we'll uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all on another uh, webinar on this topic soon. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you, Robert.